before Congress. Francis ends his encyclical by appealing to the Mass, to Sunday, to the Trinity, that needs to be revisited, and the intercession of Mary. Intercession of Mary. Yep. There is much truth in the encyclical, but it is laced with error. I mean, the, are the causes bad? Is it bad to emphasize family? Is it bad to care for the environment? No. Is it bad to care for the poor? No. Good causes. Wrong motivation. If you drink 100,000 parts of water mixed with one part of cyanide, it will kill you. A great degree of truth laced with a slender part of error can be spiritually deadly. Now let's go to the next section, a deceptive system. Why are so many clergymen and politicians in the Christian world wandering after the papal system? The reason is that they have chosen to cast aside the lurid history of the papacy, either because of ignorance or because they think that the system has changed. Many claim that the papacy of today is not the same papacy of the past. Even Adventists are writing these things. It, you know, in, in Adventists today and in Spectrum, you find, you know, sometimes I wonder whether they're really Adventists by what they publish. Yeah. Yeah. They're certainly not Seventh-day Adventists in the sense that we understand a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, in the sense that Ellen White presents Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. You know, they write, this papacy has changed. But in this they ignore the fact that the papacy itself claims that it does not change. Its motto is semper idem, always the same. But the simple fact is that the papacy cannot any more change its fundamental nature than a person can change his DNA. Persons may change their external appearance by putting a lot of makeup and their earrings and all those things, but their DNA remains the same. Likewise, the papacy may give itself a facelift, but underneath the change of appearance is the same DNA. Ellen White has well described the deceptive nature of the papacy in the Great Controversy, page 571, when she said, The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be the apostasy of the latter times. And now is the best description of the papacy I've ever found, especially Jesuits. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose, but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. A chameleon is a lizard. I lived in Latin America. Many of you have been uh, were from tropical countries. A chameleon is a lizard that is able to change colors, depending on the environment where it is found. In this way, it is able to camouflage itself from its potential enemies. But despite the change in external color, a chameleon is a chameleon still. This is the way in which the papacy operates. On the surface it appears innocuous and charitable, but by its very nature when it ascends to power it is despotic, totalitarian, and rules with an iron fist. And that's what people don't realize. And Ellen White says the United States is playing around the snare. And once the United States is caught in the snare, it will not be able to escape. It'll be too late. Many have pointed out that the Jesuit Pope Francis I has ex exhibited great love for the destitute and outcast of society. He washes the feet of prisoners, lives in humble quarters, drives an old beat-up car, lays hands on children, hugs lepers, refuses to judge gays speaks about love and peace, and fights for the preservation of the environment. Above all, he defends the rights of the poor. This has led most of the world to have a positive image of the Roman Catholic system, hasn't it? Yeah. It is striking that what Francis does is quite similar to what Jesus did while he was on the earth. Did Jesus bless the children, lay his hands on children, and embrace the poor, and refuse to judge the, those who were sinners? Uh, in, the, in the view, in the eyes of the righteous people of that day and age? Absolutely. So it's striking that Francis uh, does, what he does is quite similar to what Jesus did while he was on earth. This has led many to conclude that he is the representative of Christ on earth. But 
it is really a masterful counterfeit. He who claims to be vicarious filidae, it's that means one who claims to occupy the place of Jesus Christ. Amen. Or vicarius Christi, that means vicar of Christ. The one who claims to occupy the place of Jesus on earth is actually the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, that is the church claiming that he is God. And here's something, it is sobering to realize that Judas Iscariot also manifested a seeming interest in the poor. And Judas, who is called the son of perdition, wanted a temporal earthly kingdom and had his own colleagues fooled until the very end. I have a two hour presentation on the man of sin. It hasn't been edited yet, but it's going to be edited. That prophecy of 2 Thessalonians 2 is powerful. Is it any surprise that the papacy is presently able to deceive almost the entire world? Is it any coincidence that 2 Thessalonians 2 refers to the papacy with the same name as Judas, the son of perdition? There must be a connection in their characters because the name represents characters. So if Judas is called the son of perdition and the papacy is called the son of perdition, there must be many similarities. And remember that Francis I is a member of the Jesuit order. Regarding their mode of operation, Ellen White explains. Now this is a description of what Francis I looks like today. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons. Has that happened recently with Francis? Yes. And hospitals. Mm -hmm. Ministering to the sick and the poor. Mm -hmm. Professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the chameleon aspect, folks, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often what? Were often concealed. You know, there's, there's not a lot of overt references to Sunday. You know, some people say, well, is there a national Sunday law in Congress? No. Because the Sunday movement does, is not overt at first, it's covert at first. Notice this statement from Ellen White. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not, the, do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Did you notice the term? It's, making it way in darkness, the leaders are concealing, people don't see what's happening in the undercurrent. Its professions are what? Mildly, mild and apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. Now we're almost finished here. We'll come to a very important part. In the context of what I've written, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a special relevance for this time. Our very name was providentially chosen for a time such as this. Think of it. Our very name points us to a supernatural beginning and a supernatural end. Creation in seven literal days and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The three angels' message has the same beginning and ending point. The first angel's message commands the entire world to worship the Creator. And this directs our attention to the literal seven-day beginning. And immediately after the third message, Jesus is seen sitting on a cloud and coming to the earth, pointing us to the second coming. Thus the three angels' message just begin with creation and they end with the second coming. Just like the name, Seventh-day Adventist. While the first angel's message commands us to worship the Creator, the third warns us not to worship the beast. Do you see the contrast? First angel says, worship the Creator, keep the Sabbath. Now if the Sabbath is the sign of the Creator, then the beast has his mark too. So what, the, what must the mark of the beast be, or the sign of the beast? It must be the day that he has changed. Thus worshiping the Creator and worshiping the beast are opposites. If the Sabbath is the sign of the true Creator, 
then the beast must have a, a day that is a counterfeit sign. Ellen White has correct, was correct when she wrote this. No name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world, and I would say to the Catholic world as well. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. And then she says, the people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. You know, when we were going to go to this Philadelphia project, we had emails from people saying, you know, should you really do that? You know, should, you're going to make people angry. You know, this is the Pope's moment. You know, I, I received it. This is the Pope's moment. Don't spoil his party, is basically what they're saying. Folks, if now is not the time, I don't know when the time is going to be. And Ellen White says we need to warn people about this dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. While we have freedom of speech, it's going to be a lot more difficult later. There is no other church in the world, folks, that claims that their mission is to reach the world with the three angels' message. There's no other church that says this is our mission and this is our message. God knew that the remnant church needed to have a name that would distinguish it from the apostate triumvirate. Our very name is a witness and a rebuke to Catholicism, Protestantism, and worldlings and stands in contrast to their view of the beginning and of the end. So where does Secrets Unsealed fit in? From its very inception, Secrets Unsealed has committed itself to preaching the three angels' message. We believe that our God-given duty is to call the world to worship the Creator and to shun the beast, his image, and his mark. Pure and simple, this is the reason why we exist. Ellen White has written concerning the reason for our existence as a church, and I quote, There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Other than preaching these three messages. That's why we exist. If we're not doing this, we have no reason to exist. God has not called us so that our main mission is to, is to build mega churches. You know, the reason why people flock to mega churches is because, is because the message that is, presented, that is presented is palatable to their wishes. As we have traveled to different places, many have expressed appreciation that we have kept the Three Angels logo on our exhibition booth, on our letterhead, our newsletter, and our fundraising letters. And it will continue to be so. Recently, someone asked me somewhat sarcastically, if Secrets Unsealed is all about the three angels' message, why did you waste three years on the women's ordination issue? What? <coughs> That's what they said. Waste three years. Now listen. My answer was swift. The first angel's message calls us to worship the Creator and to return to His original Genesis plan. The Genesis plan includes the Sabbath, marriage, diet, and the roles that God assigned to men and women in the home and in the church. Amen. And the first angel calls us to worship the Creator. That must mean restoring the roles. Not much. In fact, Paul himself directs us back to creation when he refers to the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. Furthermore, the relationship of the Father and the Son in the Godhead is reflected in the relationship between Adam and Eve at creation. <laughs> Amen. I read this statement, Great Controversy 581. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. They're fooling around at the, at, the, at the opening of the snare right now. They don't know that they're playing with fire. We need to tell them. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, let's look at some flaws as we summarize some flaws in, uh, I'm just going to deal this with this one last section, then you can read the true motivations part because there's something that I want to say before we come to an end. What are some of the flaws of, of the arguments of Francis in his encyclical? Number one, how can Pope Francis encourage us to care for God's created order when he does not even believe that the creation story is literal? Is that a valid point? Yes. Second, even if the Pope believed in a literal seven-day creation week, which he does not, he has chosen the wrong day to commemorate it. Amen. The Bible is unambiguously clear that the day to allow the created order to rest is on the seventh-day Sabbath, not on Sunday. Third, the motivation behind Francis' call for his reforms is open to question. It seems like the ultimate objective of his climate change, family, poverty, crusade is global control. So the causes are good, but the motivation behind the causes is what we are concerned about. Fourth, even though climate change, family, and poverty are directly related to explosive population growth, the Pope simply brushes aside this factor because his church is opposed to birth control. In paragraph 50 of his encyclical, he reprimands those who claim that population growth is a significant factor in the crisis for world the world presently faces. He says population growth has nothing to do with poverty. Yeah, right. Like we were all born yesterday. Notice what he says. Instead of resolving the problems of the poor and thinking of how the world can be different, some can only propose a reduction in the birth rate. Demographic growth, he says, is fully compatible with an integral and shared development. To blame population growth instead of extreme and selective consumerism on the part of some is one way of refusing to face the issues. Fifth, Pope Francis fails to address the impact of animal husbandry upon the environment. Dr. Teske can identify with this one. Some scientists esteem that more than 50% of the methane gas in the atmosphere comes from the animal dung rather than fossil fuels. Amen. Furthermore, animal husbandry, uh, husbandry not only defiles the air we breathe, but also the rivers and the oceans. Anybody who's from Arkansas, that's a prime example of the chicken farms that are there. Arkansas is a beautiful state, by the way. I'm not saying that you should go there. So if Francis is so concerned about God's creation plan, why not encourage everyone to become a vegan? Amen. Amen. <laughs> what good is it to tell everyone in the Vatican to turn off lights and to turn down the air conditioners and then be a voracious meat eater, as an Argentinian, by the way, that keeps the meat producers mass-producing animals that will defile the environment. Finally, Francis lacks a clear concept of how things began and how they will end. The Bible states that things will wax worse and worse and the second coming will be the only solution to the problem. The Pope, however, sees a great future for the planet under the moral leadership of the papacy. And then the final section deals with how you can really resolve these issues. The real problem, folks, is not the problems with the environment and the poor. The problem is with human selfishness. Yeah. And unless you resolve the problem of human selfishness, these other problems will never be resolved. Now, in conclusion, what can we do when we leave this place? Some practical suggestions. Number one, take the presentations that we have produced here. They will be on YouTube. They're not on YouTube now, right? We're not live streaming. We'll put them on YouTube. They'll be available to everybody. Make sure you send uh, these to as many people, the, the news about them to as many people as you can, your Facebook, email, etc. Use social media. 
to share this, sympo this uh, uh, summit as well as the symposiums that have been done previously on this particular issue. Second, start a study group in your home and invite people to come. By the way, don't do this secretly behind your pastor's back. Tell your pastor, you know, I'm, I want to start a study group in my home. There's, there's no reason why the, they should forbid you from doing that in your own home. Show them the, the, these videos. Other uh, faith-increasing materials. Number three, pray without ceasing that the Lord will be with His church and that the Lord will make the necessary adjustments. Speak from person to person about the dangers that are facing the church. Some will listen, some won't. You know, the ones who don't listen, you know, that have their minds made up, you know, Jesus said, shake the dust off your shoes and go to the next person. There will be people who will listen. Let's not keep silent. Let's speak up. Let's be nice. Let's be loving and kind. But let's be bold and clear and firm at the same time.